Welcome travelers to my podcast, Hitchhiker's Guide to Ethical Non-Monogamy. I am your host, Ike, and I will be your guide through the journey that is e and Hey yo, what's going on travelers? It's been a little minute, but I'm glad to be back and I'm glad to have y'all back. Just had some things to take care of on my end because life is hectic as hell, but I'm glad that you're still here on this journey with me as we go ahead and, you know, go ahead and discover these things through ethical non-monogamy and whatnot. Um, but yeah... What's oh sorry, I didn't even introduce myself. It's been that long. A little rusty, huh? Oh uh, well, I am Ike, also known as Hedo in certain circles. I am your guide into this wondrous vast void that is ethical non-monogamy. Do I know it all? No. Would I like to know it all? Yes, and that's the reason why we're here. Now, as far as the road trip this time around, we're not gonna go with music, we're gonna go with reading again because reading is fundamental and audiobook do, does it for you well. And that would be the book Set Boundaries, Find Peace by Nedra Glover Tawab. Now, this isn't an E&M book specific, but this is a book talking about boundaries. How to kind of set them so that way you yourself can actually protect yourself from essentially self-harm or harm from others. It is a great read. I feel like everyone that, be it monogamous, non-monogamous, friendship, platonic, should go ahead and give this book a read because it actually does help with the overall outlook of what boundaries should, can look like, as well as enforcement and things of that nature. Um, if you are not a reader like me, shout out to my ADHD folks out there that struggle reading the same paragraph over and over. It is on audiobook. If you have a subscription, it's just the one credit and you are good to go with that book. Um, but yeah, just... Go ahead, give it a listen. It is a great time. Now, um, as far as the weekly recap, it's been, what, three weeks now since I've been on here? So a lot has gone on, and at the same time, a lot has not. Um, so I was taking this sociology class, self-paced. Sadly, I didn't. I mixed up dates because apparently I have my slow moments, so I wasn't able to take the final in time. But I can take the class again. It's just that classes cost so much money. But if I want to make more money, I gotta get this math degree. If I want to get this math degree, I gotta do all these these rules and classes and whatnot. So I guess I'll do what I can to get that taken care of. But beyond that, working nine to five because this does not pay the bills. Um, I have been able to go travel a bit, ex- um, explore my kinky sign um, with some friends I've made around the c- uh, city of Texas, <laughs> the city of Texas, state of Texas. Um, I was able to go to this event called Kinknick Ran by Madam Carmen. Um, it was a great time. I saw some of my kinky friends out in Houston, was able to do like a waxing, was able to do some impact with my um, two floggers I brought. Overall, great ass time. Um, got to see my very good friend, as well as my essentially comment like partner, where we cross paths, we hang out, we have a good time chatting, among other things that adults do. Um, uh, what else happened? I already explained my anchor partner is like my nesting partner now. Been here for almost two months. And honestly, it feels like when the pandemic started, that's kind of how we started our relationship where we were stuck together for like a month. Overall solid, nothing too crazy, but I'm really like, I just go with the flow a lot. So it's not as if there's a lot of um, changes and hiccups or things that I find problematic that I have to cause an uproar for. I mean, there are some like little things kind of like, I don't like cups in my sink. I I always get scared that they're going to break under like a plate or something, you know, or um, spoons on the garbage disposal side, you know, just like those little ticky tack things. But I make sure I address them because I feel like holding them in will build up resentment. And I'd rather have a a lot of little paper paper cuts versus a big bomb at the end where I don't even know what I'm upset for. But all of a sudden I'm spewing all these feelings, you know what I'm saying? Um, But yeah. Um, been able to kick it more with my other, um, partner. It, you know, it's kind of essentially the, not, um, relationship anarchy set with that one is essentially friendship. Um, we are going to go to Experience Covet's, um, opera that's happening May 21st in LA. So we're going to fly out. She's going to be able to hang out with her sister and just go ahead and kink, um, hang out with some black kinky folks that are cool as fuck. 
Um, the other partner that I had where I did explain, like, it's not really like a partner partner. It's like there are some stipulations where, you know, essentially play, hang out, go out on dates, nothing crazy, nothing complicated. Um, that sort of ended, not even ended, it kind of downgraded to where we remove the sexual and dating aspect of it and just keep the friendship part. Now, the BDSM aspect might be added on later, but she essentially found someone, um, uh, she's dating someone and she said herself, she prefers a monogamous setup and that was something that was established from the beginning. So it wasn't as if I was trying to convert her to be e and them. If anything, it was just, I guess, pa- strangers passing the night, just passing time along. But she's cool as fuck. I'm glad I still get to chat with her and interact and whatnot. Maybe we have some we add later. Maybe it will not. But it's always good to have good people in your corner. Um, but yeah, that's as far as the updates go. Um... Now, something I want to start doing with the podcast, I was thinking about kind of going more into my journey. I did spend an entire episode kind of talking about how did I get to this point, but I never really talked about certain nuance that developed in between. And um, last week, I was actually thinking about how I broke it to my friends, um, the kind of dynamic that I was going for in my next relationship, because they only know of a couple of my partners in the past. I'm not like a serial date or anything like that. I just go with the flow, with the vibes take me to, the vibes will take me to, and I just be there. And uh, when I was explaining the overall um, concept of non-monogamy, it was, it, of course, it's going to be foreign to them because all they know, even in their lives, be it whether the fathers are in their lives, fathers are out of their lives, they just know that you find woman, you date woman, you marry woman, you have kids, you grow old together, and if things don't work out, maybe get a divorce. So that's all they knew. The concept of having multiple intimate sexual or um, romantic partners, that's foreign because you talk to them about side piece, they know all the rules. They know anything about be it side chick, sneaky links, etc. But bringing up the idea of two like full on partners, all of a sudden it becomes uh, what is it called? The Gregorian knot. Yeah, your boy's smart. <laughs> but yeah, but what the reason why I was thinking about this last week is what was coming to mind is the reaction it. It was one friend in particular. The other two were curious about the overall aspect, what it all means. But one friend was really stuck on one pure concept. And that is me being okay with my partner having sex with other men. Now, he had no question about, wait, so you, your woman is allowing, quote unquote, allowing you to go have sex with other women. That question never came up. The question was, you're allowing your women to have sex with other men? And it's like, I never really thought about that conversation until that recent moment where I was like, why would he be so fixated on that? Like, why is his thoughts on, man, I am allowing my woman to go sleep with other men? And it was a thought, it was something that came to a couple years ago, and that is one of the fundamental flaws in all aspects of dating that media, society, etc. shows us, is that when you're dating someone, when you marry someone, when you're with someone, they are no longer a person, but they are now your property. And I have problems with that. Because me personally, I refuse to be owned like someone's property. I am not someone's pet. I am not someone's plaything. I am not someone's toy. Like, no, I am me. I am my own whole ass person. The same way I see my partner as a whole ass person. This is not my object. This is not my plaything. I do not control aspects of their life. If I tell them jump, they are going to ask me why. And if I'm over here because I said so... All right, it depends on the scene. Like, in some cases, look, if I got the flogger and we're doing a little sceny scene, I'm just saying, they might go ahead and jump. But, 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 we're talking about just the standard relationship type of feel. It's just, it's weird the kind of possessiveness that that we have. 
And I think that's how he was looking at it. Because the whole word allow is, that's the main word. It's the idea that I am giving her permission. No, I'm not. It's not a permission thing. She could, she's been having sex with other men before me. She'll have sex with other men after me if we don't work out. So for the idea that you are to limit yourself and all your desires because I said so, but I get to go out and fulfill my uh, my own, even if it's without your knowledge, be it sneaky link or otherwise. Like you see how fucked up the concept is of how you own a person and how that person owes you certain things just because y'all decide to be together. Like, no. Now, I do believe that you are not to cross an established boundary that you agree to. That's different. Because it's not a situation where you simply assume what are what you can and cannot do. Like this one... For me, the way I define cheating is ignoring and breaking a boundary of your partner. Like, when me and my anchor first got together, we talked things out. One of the main things I let it be known, I love kissing. Kissing is, I just, I genuinely enjoy kissing. And I'm not going to limit that to just between me and you. Because... I know if she was like, oh, no, that's too intimate. You're not allowed to kiss anybody. This ain't going to work because I told her off the rip, this is who I am. And I was, I'm was, i not going to be a part of a situation where there's something I really like to do, but I'm holding it back because I refuse to tell her. Because the reason why we establish these boundaries early is so that we will, that way we know are we wasting each other's time or not. But in the, in the heteronormative world that we have, no one talks about boundaries. You just talk about, I think you're cute, funny, and cool. Let's go together. Cool, we go together. That's, that's the end of the conversation. And then you discover your follies along the way. And with it's just how it's kind of like how can he see what I'm doing is weird when I'm telling you what you're actually doing out loud and that sounds even weirder. You get what I'm saying? But that's, I think that's the whole thing. We have to get rid of the ownership mindset when it comes to our partners because they are whole ass human beings. Now, I am not saying, oh my God, monogamy is not natural. I don't believe in that because everything is natural under the sun because we're humans. We get to make up whatever we want at any time. At some point, it was natural to get naked and oiled up and wrestle at the, and wrestle at the Olympics. Th- so... The fact that we're trying to use human uh, human nature as if, like, we're supposed to follow what penguins and wolves and caterpillars do, like, no. We make up our own destiny. We made, we made up the economy. We made up marriage. We can make up monogamy and non-monogamy. So I won't say that not, monogamy is not natural, but there are a lot of aspects of monogamy that's currently standing that is unhealthy, which I really do feel like should be worked through. But alas, um, he's he's on doing his thing. I believe he's single right now. He's doing the dating thing. I wish him all the luck because it's kind of great going through life with a partner. It's it makes things easier. It makes things fun. So, wish him all the luck. On my end, I am fortunate. I have some wonderful people in my lives. And I am just glad that this journey has led me to them because otherwise I would be holed up in some house with one partner just looking out the window wondering what if. But yeah, that, that was pretty much my thoughts from last week. Um, hopefully someone took something from that. Mainly people are not your possession, so let them live or move on. But, you know, you, you take what you want to take from it. I'm just the speaker, you're the listener, and I appreciate you for it. Now, we're going to just go ahead and take a quick break because I do want to get into this episode where we are going to look at the various aspects of polyamory, the various um, configurations and everything involved. All right. See you all in a moment. All right, and welcome back. And yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. So, 
what I want to go ahead and discuss right now is the main point of the episode, which are the various aspects of uh, polyamory. Now, understand when it comes to polyamory, the whole point of going into this form of ethical non-monogamy is so that you can set up your own roles, you can set up your own dynamics the way you see fit. <clears throat> These terms I'm about to say, say right now is not a mandatory must-have com- configuration. It's just kind of how you can explain to others how your dynamic works. Kind of like, you know, if someone says go straight, they're telling you, all right, you're going down straight in a straight line. To say turn right, you turn to the right. It's like the words mean things. It doesn't mean it dictates everything. Now, the first, um, what I want to go ahead and get into first are kind of, essentially can be used as um, polycule variations. Now, understand a polycule, kind of like a molecule, if you um, studied um, biology, is kind of a setup where things interconnect. Like you have one partner that has two partners, and then those partners, maybe one doesn't have anything, but another partner has two other partners. That whole sketch is known as a polycule. It's kind of like how is people, how are people connected. Now, the, these polycule variations can go in um, these set forms. Now, we have what's known as a V. So what a V indicates is there is one partner with two other partners, and those other partners do not connect whatsoever. So for instance, in a scenario with me, there is me and my anchor partner and my play partner, but they themselves do not interact. Therefore, that is a V dynamic. Now, you have triads. When it comes to a triad, that means that all three, all parties are um, connected. So, A, so pretty much A is connected to B and C, B is connected to C and A, um, C is B and A, so everyone is connected. Now, just because it's a triad does not mean that the relationship is closed, it just means that all three parties are connected. They can still have their own various um, connections outside of that triad dynamic. And then there is quad. Now, quads can um, happen in a situation where there's one partner with two connecting parties and it goes all the way around. Think of two Vs coming together. Now, within the quad, you can also have cross lines within each other, showing that everyone is interconnected. Um, Because you can't forget that, yes, there are bisexual women, but there are also bisexual men. Well, bisexual and biromantic men and women, they also configure. Um, so these relationships are not just stuck to male, hetero, male, hetero, female, or hetero, male, bisexual, female. Like, no, these are set up by any kind of variations, however you see fit. That is the beauty and freedom when it comes to an ethical non-monogamy. Now, like I said before, just because you're in a triad, it does not mean that it's an automatically closed dynamic. What would make it closed is if it's established that way, also known um, as polyfidelity, where those within the dynamic can only interact with each other. There is no outside party. If you interact with an outside party sexually or romantically, that is essentially cheating and breaking the boundaries of polyfidelity. So you could be in a, a triad, a quad, but no matter what, everyone interacts with everyone within that dynamic alone and no one outside. Now, is it possible to bring someone from outside within the dynamic? Yes, but then the same rules will still apply where it is a closed relationship with all parties involved. Now, going down the list, we also have hierarchical polyamory. Now, it's as stated, hierarchical means there are rankings. So you'll have your primary, your secondary, and tertiary. So, for an example, your primary could be someone that you knew in high school, someone that you're married to, someone that you're living with. Secondary could be a girlfriend. So, for instance, primary would be a wife. Secondary would be a girlfriend or boyfriend picked up later down the line. They do not hold the position of the primary. So there is a possibility of what's known as veto power, where the primary partner can call an audible and have you cancel a date or have their needs met before um, that of the secondary. And then you have tertiary, which is simply like the third level. Now, these could be play partners or like you go to a, a play party, like those kind of dynamics. So there are rankings set up in hierarchical uh, polyamory. There's nothing unethical about it. As long as you're honest and upfront, as well as recognize the humanities of those that are ranked below the primary, everything typically works out. 
because I know of um, some women out there. They want to be the secondary. They are not out here trying to fill the role of a primary partner. So they're okay with the secondary role. And if things change, they'll let it be known and move on. That that's what you do. You let when things change, you make a move. Now the next level below the, now below that I do have listed as non hierarchical polyamory. Now that is essentially touching into relationship anarchy where there are no primaries like everything is all on set footing everything is discussed and amicable if anything you are doing the balance of equal versus equi- equi- equitable <laughs> No, that word was tricky to get out. But yes, equal versus equitable is that kind of um, range for that dynamic. And for that, normally the term anchor partner is used. Anchor being kind of like, hey, this is where home is. This is home base. That is not to say that there can't be multiple anchor partners. And that's not to say that um, your anchor partner is above your other partners. It's just simply saying that, okay, I know home base is here. It's kind of like a ground, feet on the ground kind of um, deal right there. Normally, that anchor partner is someone that they've interacted with a long time, or in some cases, someone that they mesh really well with each other, and they kind of take those steps. Now, um, we also do have kitchen table polyamory. What they mean by so what it meant by kitchen table polyamory is just simply that all partners involved are able to simply like get together for uh, at the kitchen table and be amicable with each other. There is no animosity between metas. It's just simply you can all get together and get along. So that's what um, that entails with um, kitchen table polyamory. Now, that is not to say everyone's romantically involved or there's anyone like having like having sex with one another. It is a possibility, but is not um, necessary for kitchen table polyamory to work. Um, there's also parallel polyamory, where is essentially um, going to the realm of quad, where two partners interact, but they never really cross with one another. Um, we have monopolyam, so that's monogamy, polyamorous, hybrid relationship. So that would be one partner is polyamorous while the other partner is monogamous. These do work as long as you communicate and are upfront, because I know plenty of people that are okay um, being with um, a partner that's polyamorous. And by plenty of people, I mean like maybe pff, pff, 10. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I guess 10 is a lot to me because I, I, I don't know. I don't know why I said plenty of people. But I know people that are okay with this dynamic because they understand all they want, need, and can handle is just the one partner. And they have no um, desire to go out there and get multiple partners, especially if that one partner is meeting their needs and um, that other partner doesn't neglect them because, again, it's just, it's simply polyamory, except this partner has no extend, extensions to their polycule. It's like a full on stop. That's all that is. It works with communication, honesty, being upfront on both sides, especially if one is feeling, if there's any bouts of jealousy or anything of that nature, it has to be addressed, or otherwise that will fail. Um,. There is um, lap sitting polyamory, which is something new that I learned. Um, those are essentially relationships between metas. Now, um, yeah, these can go into the realm of sexual. Um, it's not ma- it's not mandatory. It does go into friendship. So it's I don't know where they get the term lap sitting for it, but. It's the dynamics between the metas. Not not even worried about the um, paramours. It's all about the meta interaction. That's what um, lap sitting polyamory goes into. There is garden table polyamory. So it's almost like kitchen table, except it's primarily about big events. Say your um the the main um connector has gotten a promotion at a job and he wants to go out for drinks and dinner. Everyone in their dynamic is amicable in those situations where you go out to celebrate, be it a promotion or um, some kind of success. Like they are able to go to an event, be amicable and cool with each other with no problem. So it's not as stringent as um, kitchen table where it's like, yo, we get together at a dinner table. We should all be cool. This one's like, eh, whenever we get together, as long as we're good. New term that I've learned. Um, there is also don't ask, don't tell. Now, 
this can be used in multiple aspects of um, ethical non-monogamy. And yes, don't ask, don't tell can be ethical as long as honesty is being put front. Because some people, jealousy is a feeling you can't control and some people can't control their reactions to it. And so they opt for ignorance because ignorance is bliss. As long as you are being responsible and safe, say um, you are wrapping up or there's birth control or some kind of contraceptive, um, you're doing your testing to make sure you're not passing any viruses and, you know, you're just being upfront and honest in those situations. They're going to tell you, OK, I don't need to know when you have sex or I don't need to know when you're going to see this person. It's all about... Um, it's pretty much all about setting a boundary to protect oneself. Now, this can be unhealthy because if they're not telling you, then there are some aspects of communications that will be missed because they can't tell you. And also, it's you might have a partner that wants to share their happiness with you, and they might build feel a bit insecure or might build some resent if they are unable to um, kind of release in that way. So, again, it takes a lot of communication, takes a lot of work. It is not recommended, but people still have success using this method um, of interaction. Now, one of the big ones is solo polyamory. Now, concept of the solo polyamory is pretty simple. It is a form of hierarchical um, polyamory where the individual themselves are their own primary. So essentially, you are dating yourself. You take care of your own bills. You take care of everything around the house. You take care of yourself. There is nothing that another partner comes in and provides for you that you can't provide for yourself. Um, there are plenty of benefits that would come with this, especially those that love to be by themselves. They have to worry about someone sleeping in their bed. They love it. Now, drawback is, is you know, in this economy, <laughs> whew. Whew, splitting bills is almost damn near necessity at this point. <laughs> so, I mean, there are some benefits lost, like having someone um, available in your household or things of that nature. But when it comes to solo polyamory, you are taking care of yourself. Uh, you're like, you are your, at the forefront. It's all about you. It's, uh, what's the best way to put it? Actually, no, I said in the beginning, it's you dating yourself. Like, how would you treat yourself as a as a partner? And that's kind of the primary element to it. Now, other partners are secondary, um, and most solo polyamorous people let that be known, like, immediately, that, no, they can do good on their own. They don't need no one else. If anything, the fact that they are interacting with you is showing that they want you, not need you, which is a good feeling to have. Like, me, myself, I don't want my partner to need me. Now, if they need me, I want to be reliable. But I'd rather have a partner that wants me there, not needs me there. Because with, with the need, it feels like, on one hand, I have too much power. That means I get to dictate a lot because... I am a necessity to you. On the other hand, it's not fun being needed that way. Jesus Christ. I don't I wouldn't want to run for office because of all these whiny people. Like, damn. Like, oh, see, exactly. That's oh, I just turned myself off just now. <laughs> but no, that's just that's really what it comes down to it when it comes to solo polyamory. I know several people that practice this, they love it. Um, especially, um, some older women that had like a divorce or something to that effect, they learn about solo polyamory and they are reveling and living their best life because they get to dictate a lot of terms that were not privy to them in their marriage. Cause you know, it's the man's house breadwinner, yada, 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 even though the women be working and doing like house cooking and cleaning anyways, shit, a lot of wives out here already living the solo poly life by the sounds of it, but but um, yeah, that, those are the various aspects of polyamory. Again, nothing here is set in stone. These are only terms that help explain to others what it is that you're about. But honestly, you can do what you want. Just make sure you have consent, you have strong communication, and um, you have your boundaries set for yourself and understand the boundaries of others, and you can configure your polyamory however you see fit. Now, I'm going to go ahead and leave y'all with this. 
but one um word well the uh, one last word for the road <laughs> um slowly getting this podcast perfected you hear it oh we got the road to reading the music we got my personal journey plus my week review we got some knowledge and now we got one more word for the road see See, we we getting here. We are getting here. But <laughs> so one more, one more, um, one word for one well, one last word for the road. All right, I told you I'm getting there. I'm not there yet. Don't assume feelings. Now, what do I mean by that? We tend to try to predict the future in all aspects of our actions. Like when we do something, we try to predict how would this make another person feel. Whenever we actually do something that we don't consider how a person feels, and then we see the reaction. It's you're going based off past experiences, but you have to remember that everyone is different. People are unique. So always remember to not assume the feelings of others, but to actually ask them and talk through it so you can understand because you can, you are not a mind reader and they can't read your mind. What they take as malicious, you might have saw as innocent. So make sure that you do not assume the feelings of others and that you actually talk through them so you can get a better understanding for, uh, for one another and live a better, more happier life, i.e. communication. <laughs> but all right, I'm going to go ahead and leave off with that. I do appreciate y'all travelers for coming on this journey with me. You are free to hit me up on Hitchhiking to e m um, if that's my Twitter handle again, H I K N G I N G T O E N M. Um, you can hit me up on Instagram, Hitchhiker's Guide to E N M. And also, you can go ahead and send me an email at Hitchhiker's Guide to E N M at gmail.com. Questions, comments, concerns, just go ahead and drop a line. I have no problem. Go ahead and check that out. And yeah, until next time, travelers, y'all be safe.